Hey everyone, and welcome back to Suited Aces Poker, where every week we look through hundreds of online poker vlogging hands and bring you 10 of the best. This week we've got tournament poker, we've got international poker, and we've got Pokemon poker. That's right, Pokemon poker. All right, let's make a start. In at number 10, Alex Duval is playing 2-5 at the Aria in Vegas. And it's just easy money when you flop trips and your opponent's betting into you. In the next hand, I have pocket queens and we are only six handed. The under the gun, who's actually the low jack, bets $20. We three bet on the hijack to $65 and my opponent makes a call. The flop comes queen five three. We flop top set. With the pot being at 130 and being only about $500 effective, I'm going to bet here, but I'm going to bet very small. I bet $40. My opponent makes a call. The turn is the ace of hearts. This is obviously a great turn card as my opponent can definitely have an ace here. When they check, I want to bet and set up a river gem, so I go for a sizing of 125. My opponent makes the call, which is just great. The river changes nothing, it's the eight of clubs. There's now about 460 in the pot and my opponent has about 250 left. Instead of having to jam all in and let them call, my opponent decides to lead for 150. This is going to be easier than I thought. Nothing to do here but put them all in for about $100 more. All in. They make the call, we show and win. Easy money when you flop sets and your opponent bets into you. We'll take it. At number nine, Ashley Sleaf is at the Venetian in Vegas and she's playing in a $400 No Limit Hold'em tournament. And I guess this one kind of looks like this hand plays itself, but it's the commentary you want to listen out for. I don't have to be sad for too long because the very next hand I look down at Pocket Kings again. This time the low jack limps in for 800. I raise it up to 3K. One small adjustment that I've been making at this table is because they're playing so many hands, I'm raising bigger pre-flop just to charge those weak holdings. When it folds back around to the low jack, he makes the call. Something to note about this low jack real quick is that earlier that? he was playing super tight and then lost, got his aces cracked to seat five and then played another hand against him with a terrible hand just to get revenge, to get very personally and told the guy, I'm going for it this time. And so I jokingly said, if we're in a hand together and you're gonna be going for it, let me know, okay? And we just kind of giggled. So now we're in this hand together. He calls and he says, I'm going for it. Okay, then you know. <laughs> Okay. thanks for letting me know. So with that little piece of information, we see a flop of Jack nine for two clubs. He leads now for 3,500 after saying he's going for it. I know he's trying to look like he's just being crazy, but I actually think he has a decent hand. I raise it up on a draw heavy board. I'm gonna raise it to 10K because even if he has a draw, I think he's gonna continue against whatever I do. He quickly calls. The turn is a six of spades, bringing a backdoor flush draw. He checks and he only has about 15K behind. So I jam all in, he makes the call and reveals that he has yep. ace, jack, and diamond. So he did in fact flop top pair, top kicker, declared that he was going for it. Somehow he knew the jack was coming. Unfortunately for him, I have an over pair and he's drawing to an ace or jack on the river. River comes, offsuit nine. We bust our neighbor, sad to see him go. He was a super nice guy, but happy to take the chips. At number eight, PK Poker is playing in his regular 2-2 home game. And with this one, we hand over to Germany. Okay, and now guys, buckle up. This hand gets crazy. You see my phone already got excited before the hand and flips over the table. But anyway, we are here with King 10 of clubs in the under the gun position and I raise to seven. The plus one player, the plus two player, the low jack, the high jack and the cutoff all decide to call. The button is next to act and he is a relative competent player who is definitely capable of seeing all the dead money here and is definitely willing to squeeze here a little lighter in my opinion to get all the dead money. And in fact he decides to squeeze here but only to 40. It falls to me and with this information in mind I think King 10 suited plays very well even out of position and we are deep around 200 big blinds I guess. So I decide to call. To my surprise all of the players behind me 
hold. I did not expect that, but we go heads up to a flop of queen 6 3 with one club. So we brick completely, and of course, I check to my opponent, and again, to my surprise, he checks back. We see the four of clubs on the turn. So we improve to a flush draw, we have still one over card, and since my opponent didn't see bet the flop, I think he could be kind of weak or very very strong. I mean if he has a hand like ace jack, ace 10, ace 5 suited or something like that, he has a hard time calling here and we still can improve to a flush on the river. So I decide to bet 75. It doesn't take too long before my opponent raises me. He raises to 175. I will pause here for a second like I did in the game. I really try to channel my inner math professor here and I go into the tank. Even though this race screams strength to me, I get a very good price. This race is really too small in my opinion and I only have to call 100 more for a pot that is already around 360 to 380 euro I guess. And with the implied odds we have around 200 euro behind after I would call this bet, after I replay this hand. I think that might be slightly leans toward a fold here but in this situation I decide to call uh, ready to jam if I hit my club on the river. And yeah, let's see a river. The dealer rolls over. The Deuce of clubs, we improve to the second nuts here. Feels pretty good. Um, of course, my opponent could have a hand like ace jack suited or maybe ace five of clubs, but that is pretty unlikely. So I decide to jam the rest of my stack for 200 and my opponent is pissed. He is really mad but doesn't think for too long and he decides to call and I show my flush and of course we are good. My opponent shows pocket queen, so he was absolutely dominating us. We had around five to 10% at max on the flop, but we made runner runner flush on him and we scooped this massive pot. At number seven, Poker Face Ash is playing at Lone Butte in Chandler, Arizona, a two, three, no limit hold'em cash game. And screw the pot, right? You gotta catch them all. This was definitely the hand of the night. So my friend Hodge raises under the gun to $15. There's two callers in early and middle position and I look down at pocket kings on the button and I wanna raise it here and I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger since there's multiple callers here even though I am in position, I make it $75. Hodge thinks for a little bit and then to my surprise he makes it 175 to go and he leaves himself about 410 behind. Five betting here would make stacks extremely awkward post flop. I didn't feel like there was any other option than to just shove all in so I go all in. Hodge doesn't think very long before tossing in a chip to make the call and so we're taking this to the streets and we're gonna see all five cards all in for over a thousand dollar pot with pocket kings. The board ran out clean and we scooped a a nice one. Hodge and I were both playing the Pokemon game. If you're not familiar with it, I learned this game in Austin at the Lodge. If you both have a Pokemon in play, whoever felts the other person or wins a pot of over $5,000, you get to take their Pokemon. So I'm trying to catch them all. And in this case, we picked up a brand new Pokemon and now we acquired Muck. And we won a very nice pot. So overall, I couldn't have asked for a better spot. At six. We've got Mariano at the Hustler in Gardena, California. He's playing in a 5-5-50 cash game. Yep, you heard that right. 5-5-50. And in this one, do you see any way of getting more value from his hand? And look down at pocket eights. The straddle is on, so I open for 300 and get called by both players on my left. Flop is above average. I'll just say that. Action checks to Eli who bets 500, player behind him folds and now it's back to me. I think most people would just call here so for that exact reason I decide to check raise. I feel like Eli won't really think I have a strong hand if I play it this way and sure enough he makes the call. Turn is a 6, a card that's mostly going to be better for him than for me so I check it but sadly he checks it back. River is the 4 of diamonds and now I choose to place a small bet hoping it'll look like I'm trying to get a cheap showdown. I expect Eli to raise with all sorts of hands against this sizing. Let's see what happens. The best part is when you got the guy in the vice, and he's like, 
Look at this guy. What a fucking Six thousand three five hundred. Oh no! You are. Oh wow, Mariano with five hundred IQ plays. He induces a raise from a seven. He induces a raise from a seven, he induces a raise from a seven. He induces a raise from a seven because Eli was that sure that he's good. Eli was that sure that he's good. All in. Okay, and now Eli is questioning everything about his life. Obviously, Eli doesn't have a hand good enough to call with here, but how sweet would it have been if he had a straight or something, right? Still, hard to complain after flopping quads. Number five, it's close to broke. He's in the 510 game at the Commerce in California. And kudos to you, Close to Broke. We did not see that coming on the river. Hijack decides to make it $35. The cutoff decides to make the call. And I'm here in the small blind. I decide to make the call with King Queen offsuit. A little bit on the looser side. I think three betting is a little better, but just calling is fine in every case. I think so. The big blind comes along as well, and we are off four or five ways to a pretty great flop that comes king 10 4 rainbow the action checks over to the initial razor who decides to see bet for 40 dollars and surprisingly every single person in this hand decides to make the call already looking to get the hell out of this situation because it's never fun to have top pair with an okay kicker or a pretty decent kicker against like three other opponents when the turn card comes to ace of hearts this looks like my out this is a horrible turn card for me Queen Jack now gets there, although I am blocking that, and uh, every ace jack or ace queen that was barreling the flop is now better than me. We decide to check it over, and astonishingly, honestly, it blows my mind when nobody bets at this and the action gets checked all the way through. So now, like every number, like the matrix is running through my mind, I'm trying to figure out what the hell everybody has. It doesn't make any sense to me that none of these people would be betting this turn card, which would be so favorable for everyone. But all that being considered, I'm never going to complain, especially when the river comes a beautiful king. No flushes get there. The only hand that really has me beat is a slow played aces or tens or a ace king, I guess. But all those hands just don't make that much sense if you don't see bet the turn. All that being considered, I decide to make a value bet here of $185. I was in between my sizings, but ended up choosing $185 because... I want to give somebody the incentive to bluff me out of the hand by showing that I can still give up the hand since I'm playing about $1,000 effective behind. So I landed on $185. It falls over to the initial raiser who goes deep into the tank. Now I'm praying for a call. Please call me with ace queen or ace jack or whatever the hell you have. And he does something that is going to surprise everyone. Oh, yeah. All in. You heard that right. There is no CGI. This is not a Hollywood actor. This gentleman decides to go all in. The action folds back over to me. And obviously, you can just even feel the disgust and the dismay. I'm completely at a loss for words. It's very infrequent where somebody does something at the table that completely blows my mind. This is the time where it completely, completely screws me up. It's so hard for a bad player or a recreational player to have a bluff here, but this is definitely the strongest player at the table. The question is, since I'm holding one of the four kings available, and there's three out there, there's three accounted for, what hands does he have for value that we can beat? There's one hand, one hand only, and that's King Jack. The only hand that can be going for value on this river as a very thin value gem. Otherwise, he's gonna have to have a hand specifically like aces, tens, or ace king for value that all beat me. All three of those hands are feasible, although not likely in his range, specifically because on the turn card that wouldn't be improving him, he does not double barrel. Especially against three other opponents, I think that's a fine card to double barrel. And again, following along with me, I know this is a really long hand and a lot of jargon has been spit out to you guys a lot of really random bluffs are in his range look there's some missing flush draws that bricked out and the more important options are there's hands like jack tens that exist hands like queen 10 that exist hands like ace jack or ace queen that can really change the entire dynamics by changing and putting these hands in their bluff range after a really really long tank 
I realized that I do have my opponent covered, and after a monstrous tank and a huge spot for me, especially considering how rough this downswing has been, I decide to make another hero call. It is inevitable. You know me. If there's a chance where curiosity will get the best of me, I am going to take it. My opponent gives the old tap, tap, run it back, and he shows Jack 10 for the bricked out gutter nutter butters and a great bluff on his hand unbelievable to turn a hand like jack into a bluff there he double blocks the nut straight as well as the set of tens that turns into a boat amazing amazing bluff on his hand i cannot hype this guy up enough amazing bluff by you you just unfortunately bluffed a station unbelievable what a hand what a crazy freaking hand at number four and brad owen is playing in the 510 game at the bellagio in vegas and in this hand, Brad teaches us all a lesson in how to overbet the river. I've dipped slightly below the even mark when I pick up pocket threes under the gun plus one in another straddle pot. Actually, from here on out, every hand is 5, 10, 20. It's a big game. I raised a 50. The small blind is the only color. We're heads up in position. The flop comes 10, 9, 3 with two spades. We've got bottom set. The opponent checks. This is a fairly coordinated board, so I could bet 50% or more of the pot. I really want to make sure I get at least some value though, and I bet $50 again in order to ensure that I can get called by an even wider range of hands. I don't like this decision as much with bottom set. It'd be better to use that sizing with top set since it's a lot less likely in that scenario that my opponent would have top pair. Small blind calls 50, maybe I can get him to put a lot more money in on future streets. The turn is the deuce of diamonds, I love to see that. We still have the third best possible hand. Small blind checks. I want to target top pair hands, and believe it or not, the small blind could have reasonably flatted my preflop raise with a hand as good as pocket queen, so there's some small possibility that I'm up against an overpair. I increase my sizing to 180. This should look a bit like a bluff. I would have taken a similar line with a hand like ace five of diamonds or potentially even a front door flush draw. The larger bet doesn't deter the small blind from sticking around. He calls. I've got 1435 behind, and the opponent has me slightly covered. You may be thinking, stacks are pretty large compared to how big the pot is. It's weird to bring attention to that detail, but my mind is focused on getting every chip that I can get. The river is the five of clubs. It's one of the best cards that the dealer could have put out there. Both flush draws miss. All of the most obvious straight draws like queen jack and eight seven miss, and no over cards came out. If our opponent has a hand like ace 10, this is set up perfectly for us to get maximum value. Small blind checks. I'm thinking about how this hand has played out so far and how much I want to bet. If my opponent has a missed draw, he won't be able to call a bet of any amount, and he's called two bets so far, indicating that if he does have a hand with showdown value, it's likely pretty solid, and he'd probably be willing to call a big bet here. I bet the biggest amount that I can. That's right. We're all in for about two and a half times the size of the pot. I'm hoping this will look like a last ditch effort of mine to steal what's in the middle with a hand like queen jack of clubs or diamonds. A lot of the time when I've made plays like this in the past, it actually has been with complete air. You might be thinking it's stupid to do this for value since it's so unlikely that I'll be able to get called by something worse, and I'm just squandering a great opportunity to at least make some money, perhaps up to even four or five hundred. I mostly agree with that assessment, but occasionally I need to mix it up. And when I don't have any cards blocking top pair or second pair, this seems like an okay spot to swing for the fences, particularly when there were plenty of draws that have missed. This play doesn't need to work out that often in order for it to make me a lot of money. The opponent is in agony, he certainly doesn't have me beat, and almost definitely only has one pair at best. After tanking for 50 seconds, the small blind comes to a decision. This is one of the few times we massively overbet for value and actually get called. We smash one into the bleachers to win a $3,500 pot. Not only do we get paid the maximum, but this helps balance my range for when I actually am bluffing for large amounts. I'm ecstatic to get called here. The session's going great. We're up around 1700 with plenty of poker left to be played. At number three, Mariano is at the Hustler, playing in the 1020. And so often, it's about what's going on in your opponent's head, not about what's going on in your own hand. Right? I buy in for $10,000 and find the first interesting spot of the day with pocket tens in the straddle. There's a few limpers before Israeli Ron makes it 240 out of the small blind. The big blind calls the 240, and then it's on me. This is already an iffy spot because every time I've played with Ron, he's been very tight and never really gotten out of line, so I decide to just flat call instead of re-raise. 
Only one of the limpers makes the call, so we go four ways to a flop. We manage to hit an over pair on 983, but after Ron continues betting, it's not looking too good for me. In my mind, the odds of him raising preflop and then continuing to fire into three opponents with a hand worse than tens seems rather unlikely. But still, I can't fold just yet, so I make the call, and so does Barry behind me. The turn brings in the flush and some straights, so it's no surprise that Ron now checks it. It's very possible that Barry has some of those hands, so I check as well, but he ends up checking it back, so we're off to a river. The deuce of clubs shouldn't change anything, and this is where the hand really starts to pick up. Ron decides to now bet $1,500, which to me confirms my suspicion that I'm up against a bigger overpair. Obviously, I'm dead wrong, as you guys can see by the graphics, but how the hell am I supposed to know this guy had five deuce offsuit? Anyway, at this point, I decide the best course of action is to turn my hand into a bluff and try to make life difficult for Ron with a hand like aces, kings, or queens. I mean, I could have some two pair, sets, even straights that sometimes play this way. And yeah, Barry is still left to act behind, but I wasn't too worried about him after he checked back on the turn. Let's see what happens. All in. All in. Oh boy. Mariano moves all in. That lets Barry get out of the way pretty easily. Yeah, okay. You can't fold here, Ron. You went for your phone. Yeah. Huh? Oh, it's what do you have, a 6-7? That's what I think you have. Oh. I would have run good the last week. I would have snapped for him. No, no, I thought that he was asking what time. What Ron's saying here is real. He's talking about how the last week he's been running bad. And if not for that, he would have snap called. And sometimes when you're running bad, it just feels like the other guy always has it. And I think he's in his own head here, overthinking it. And he folds. Wow. I hope he didn't block me. After a few painful minutes, Ron announces a fold. Of course, I had no idea until after the stream that he somehow had two pair, which is pretty funny. But either way, happy to take it down. In at number two, and we see Branson playing in the 2-3 game at the Hustler in California. And this is a fun one. We get to see the action from Branson and his vlogger opponent. Okay, here's what you guys have been waiting for, a little vlogger on vlogger action. I have pocket nines in the small blind and the button opens to $17. I debated between 3-betting and calling and since I had been throwing in a lot of 3-bets, I just called this time. It's on to Lex who picks up pocket aces in the big blind. The button opens up to $17. The small blind makes the call. I put in a three bet to $55. The button folds. Now the action is on the small blind. A little background information on this guy. His name is Branson. We ended up meeting up at the commerce and played a 510 session together. I didn't play many hands with him while I was there, but what I gathered from watching is that he's pretty solid and he knows what he's doing. So whenever he calls a three bet out of position, I put him on a lot of pocket pairs, maybe fives through pocket tens. Lex is right on as I have pocket nines, I call, and we see a flop that comes king, nine, six, rainbow, bang. I hit a set and I check to Lex. Lex puts out a small bet of $30 and I think of what to do. Against most players, raising with middle set seems pretty standard, but I know he knows what he's doing. I also know that he knows I know what I'm doing. As the preflop 3 better, this flop should heavily favor him, as he can have aces, kings, and ace king, while I really can't. Also, there's no flush draw, so if I raise, I think he'll often suspect I have a set. Because of this, I just call. I'm not sure what it was, but I kind of got a bad feeling. I had a feeling that he had a monster. I'm not sure if it was the way he called on the flop or the speed he called. I don't know. Seems like pretty normal behavior to me, Lex. But I just had a bad feeling. So when the turn is a deuce and he checks it over to me, I decide to actually check this turn card back. The river comes another king. Now we have a full house. But when he checked back the turn, I don't really expect them to have aces, kings, or ace, king very often. If I bet, he'll very likely fold, but if I check, my hand is pretty disguised and it gives him rope to try and bluff. I check, and Lex puts out a bet of $110. 
Now it's time to put in a raise and I make it 310 total. If he has a king, he'll most likely call, but even hands like aces, queens, or jacks might want to try and bluff catch. Most people won't check the flop, turn, and river with a really strong hand, plus he might think I want to bluff him for his vlog. He ends up making the call, I show, he mucks, and I take down a large pot against Lex O Poker. Do not subscribe to this guy's channel. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to this Bless guy's it. channel. <laughs> and at number one, it's our boy Ethan, Rampage Poker, playing in a $400 World Series of Poker circuit event down in the beautiful Aruba. And we've all been the opponent in this situation. So gross, Ethan. So gross. But no need to celebrate because the very next deal, I pick up pocket nines and I raise it up to 3,500. The player to my left jams about 30,000. Um, this is the same player that I just sucked out on. So maybe he's tilt shoving, but he's got 20 big blinds. And with pocket nines, it is just going to be a clear call. We stick it in there and he has pocket tens. Oh my God, can we make another miracle happen again? We're off to a run out and oh my God, flop give us nothing but runner runner straight. So disgusting to crack premiums and we are massive underdogs to win, about 20% chance to win each of those hands on back-to-back -back deals. Oh my God, that is so gross. Feeling really bad for the opponent as this was just a complete luck box situation. I feel like more often than not, I am the opponent in that situation rather than Ethan. <laughs> but nice hand nonetheless. Well, that's it for this week, folks. Another 10 of the best. Thank you for watching. We appreciate the support. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And we'll see you all again next week. Good luck of the felt.